When you think about bacteria, I suspect that images that might come to mind might be those of a disease-causing agent. Or maybe you thought about some tasty food, like yogurt or natto, which are both products fermented by bacteria. You might also have thought about all these symbiotic microorganisms living on our skin and in our gut. We believe that there are at least as many of them, if not more, than there are human cells on our bodies. All these images are correct, but they seem to only represent the tip of the iceberg. The part that doesn't make the headlines, the hidden mysteries of these microorganisms, is what I'd like to tell you more about today. I jumped into the world of bacterial research over 15 years ago when I first came to this beautiful region of Tohoku because I was interested in the then emerging field of systems biology. The main concept between that research field is that biological organisms are composed of multiple components that interact with each other and that should be considered as a whole. Basically, they're like a network or a system. Traditionally, biologists study parts of cells in isolation from the system they came from. That's fine, and it has been very powerful in revealing most of what we know in biology so far. But I was interested in other ways of doing which would consider the cell as a whole entity and try to grasp its complexity. Because this is an ambitious project, one of the ways to start doing this is to start with a simpler organism. A bacteria like E. coli seemed like a re reasonable choice. At first, I was a little bit concerned about that, because until then, I had mainly worked only with mammalian cells. Now, my concern could have easily been dismissed if I had remembered the words of the famous French biochemist Jacques Monod, who in 1954 said, Anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. Of course, that was a figure of speech, but what he and his colleagues uncovered about how cells regulate their genes in response to different types of sugars basically revealed much of what we know about how cells can use their genes, something that is valid across most organisms. So what started as a bit of a concern eventually turned out to be a very eye-opening experience. Now, you may wonder why these organisms are used so widely in research. Well, the physics of life limit the rate at which nutrient and energy can be exchanged between cells and their environment. As such, bacterial cells are very small, and this allows them to do this very effectively, meaning that they can grow very rapidly, something that is very useful in the laboratory. How fast? Well, in the laboratory, under optimum conditions, cell division can occur in as little as 20 minutes. That's really fast. For example, if we were to start from a single E. coli cell and let it grow at its optimum rate, which means it can divide in about 20 minutes, and let this process go on for as little as just over 48 hours, we would end up with a mass of E. coli cells that would be equivalent to that of Earth. But don't worry. This is not going to happen, and there are good reasons for that that you probably thought about already. Basically, they are limited by resources, the food and nutrients that they need in order to grow and divide. Bacteria grow by dividing into two, a process that means that they must first make more of themselves before splitting. Now, glucose is E. coli's favorite food, maybe like for many of us. And when E. coli is grown in the laboratory in a simple broth that contains glucose, a source of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and a few other minerals, it is able to make all of its cellular components from these simple ingredients alone. Yes, that means that its DNA, all its proteins, sugar, and fat molecules can all be produced from these simple ingredients. This fate is made possible by our large network of biochemical reactions that we call metabolism. When we put together our knowledge about metabolism on a map, we end up with something like this. Don't you think that this looks like a remarkably fancy and large transportation network? 
Well, here, the reason this analogy is possible is that if we think about the molecules of the cell, the sugars and fats, as stations, then we can also imagine that the railways that connect them are the enzymatic reactions that transform one molecule into another. We end up with a massive network that is not unlike a large transportation network, but instead of having people moving around in a city, what we have is a movement of mass and energy in a metabolic network that allows the cell to maintain itself, to grow, and eventually to divide. E. coli is often called the workhorse of molecular biology, and the reason for that is that it is used widely around the world in many laboratories to put together pieces of DNA, to recombine them in new combinations, so that new proteins can be produced by cells which have applications in research, but that have also been very useful in the pharmaceutical and in the chemical industry. Now, in such cases, E. coli is used as a tool or as a vector. What I want to talk to you more about today, to mainly talk about E. coli as a subject of the research itself. Now, to make some of this work more easy, researchers in Japan and elsewhere around the world develop so-called genetic resources, where pieces of DNA in the cell, genes, have been deleted or duplicated in other cases, just like what you can do with a word processor. In 2007, with a large number of colleagues, we produced the first large-scale quantitative analysis of E. coli under different environmental and genetic conditions. We analyzed the intracellular components of the cell as they were shifted from a medium which contains very little glucose, nearly starving the cells, into conditions where they have nearly an unlimited supply of glucose. That affects their growth rate, and they can thus grow from growing very slowly to very rapidly. So under these different conditions, we isolated cells, and we measured the level of their RNA, proteins, and other small molecules in the cell. One of our major findings is we found that a lot of the RNA and the proteins in the cells were affected massively. But other parts of the metabolic network, the smaller molecules, were relatively stable across different types of growth rate. We found that the RNA and the proteins that were affected the most are those that are targeted toward the production of all the machinery and the tools that the cell needs in order to grow. So there's good connection with the needs for growth here. We also observed that at faster growth rate, the cell seems to be wasting some of their carbon, which normally would be oxidized all the way into CO2 or carbon dioxide. And instead, part of it is rejected extracellularly in the form of organic acids. So this is an example of a form of wasteful metabolism. Glucose is E. coli's favorite food, and the main reason for that is that per gram it yields more energy than most other sugars and that it is also easily uptaken. So when E. coli is placed on a different sugar for growth, something like glycerol instead of glucose, its growth rate is dramatically reduced. Now our colleagues decided to try to evolve cells in conditions where it was growing on glycerol instead of glucose and see if eventually they could obtain populations of cells that grew faster. So what they did is to grow cells in tubes and in every day change them to fresh tube, diluting them into fresh medium containing glycerol, and keep doing this for as long as necessary in order to get cells that grew faster. And they were able to do this, and the result was it took about 600 generations, a process that took about 45 days. Yes, it is a long experiment, but in evolutionary terms, 45 days compared to what the rest of nature tells us is extremely fast. Now, the cells that were produced at the end of these experiments were extracted, analyzed, and their DNA was sequenced. Now, these studies revealed that there were different mutations that accumulated in those cells that seemed to be responsible for their ability to grow more rapidly on glycerol. Now, from there, our task was to try to understand how this was possible metabolically. What we observed was somewhat of a paradox. 
One of the mutations allows the cells to grow more rapidly because it is in a gene that is directly involved in the use and processing of glycerol, making these things much more rapid and at the same time improving carbon flow. But it seems to come at a cost that much of this carbon is not used as efficiently and completely processed into carbon dioxide, but ends up in partial products that are released outside the cell in the form of organic acids showing that there's a kind of wasteful metabolism. On the other hand, the other mutation in the RNA synthesis protein ends up to have broad effects across the cells, ends up reducing the response to some stresses to acid, and it shows a general carbon-saving mode, a very economical way of doing this. Now, when these two mutations were combined together in the same cell, they allow the cells to grow almost at the double the rate as it was growing on glycerol. Seems to have combined the best of increasing the ability to use the carbon, but also using it efficiently. Together, these cells show us almost a perfect model of sustainable growth in many ways. Now in both of these studies, what we notice is that under fast growth, E. coli seems to be using wasteful metabolism. This usually happens when either there's an overabundance of the carbon source of glucose, or that there is a limitation in another nutrient like nitrogen. We know that for the cell, the production of proteins is the most energy demanding, the most costly activity. Now, the way we can interpret this effects on, during fast growth is that the costs of producing the machinery to use carbon source efficiently and grow very rapidly outweigh the benefits. Both studies also show us that there are limits to growth as they are defined by resources and the way to manage them. They offer us a very fundamental glimpse into processes of living organisms that look for solutions, often in the short term, but in the reality, environment changes rapidly. Our findings show us that there are decision-making, trade-offs, processes that happen in the cell, something that can remind us of a microeconomy brewing in the cell, I think something we can take inspiration from. Now, a possible solution to this dilemma is to consider growth not simply as an increase in the number of cells, their size or their mass, but as an increase in the number of interactions between cells, something that makes increasing complexity possible. Now, there have been reports that when cells grow at higher cell density, they start to slow down, but also to interact more with each other. So this takes us one step in the direction that bacteria like E. coli might have a more fancy social life than we had imagined. A few years ago, we observed in the laboratory cultures of E. coli in which the level of oxygen and secreted metabolic intermediates and amino acids produced detectable oscillatory signals. Now to us, that was a sign that the cells start to synchronize, they start interacting together, something that looks like at the population level. However, our work was done in liquid cultures, conditions that do not really favor interactions between the cells. Now, many other groups have worked on making, on solid media, cultures of E. coli that form colonies or biofilms. In such cases, cells grow more slowly into large structures, and it seems that they start to interact more, and that there might even be some exchanges of metabolites between different parts of the colony. Such large communities of cells develop complex two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures, and there are hints that there is some form of functional differentiation within these structures, and a shift from a more competitive mode into a more cooperative mode. We can think of large colonies or biofilms as analogs of a city where different individuals do different things at different places at different times. These bacterial microcities even look like primitive tissues or organs. There's a massive increase in complexity 
and emergence within these structures. Now, these results represent the latest frontier in microbiology, and there's still so much to uncover in this field. In spite of decades of intense research by a large community of researchers, it seems like we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. For me, it has been a very humbling experience and a very eye-opening journey. It made me realize that we have much more in common with these simple organisms than we think. And many recent findings suggest that we may need to reconsider our ideas about individuality, decision-making, behavior, sociality, and maybe even intelligence. I hope that in some way I've been able to trigger in your mind a greater appreciation for the hidden powers of bacteria, the way that it has happened to me. I also hope that you will share with me the idea that by learning more about bacteria and their hidden powers, we can learn so much more about the rest of the living world, about elephants, and about ourselves too.